We're now going to discuss uh, the end of the last session was all about how the future of the world is personal producers and entrepreneurs. And today we're going to discuss entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship can be extraordinarily sexy um, but also extraordinarily challenging. And the heart of entrepreneurship comes down to one thing, and that is the entrepreneur, right? So let's talk about the dictionary definition of an entrepreneur. What is an entrepreneur? Go to the dictionary and you will find the following definition. An entrepreneur is a person who, start right there. An entrepreneur is a person. It's not an organization, it's not a country, it's not a company, it is a person. Because remember, according to Coase, you are going to redirect the market. You as a person are going to do something that you're going to override market forces and create something yourself. So you are a person. And what do you do? You're a person who originates and operates. Again, two words over here. Organizes, that's the first thing. You create and operate. That's the second thing. You get something started, and then you keep it going. And so if you are an organizer, but you're not operating it, you're a founder. And that's really good. And then somebody else can come in and do it. And if you are an operator, but you didn't start it, you're a manager. And that's certainly good and, and the like. But an entrepreneur is somebody who organizes and then operates it. Not forever, necessarily, but to get the whole thing going. So it's really a functioning, ongoing enterprise. And then what is it that you organize and operate? Well, it's a business or businesses. And both of these are critical here, right? You can be entrepreneurial in terms of social ventures, in terms of government. Um, that's an adjective. But if you're talking about being an entrepreneur, you are in business. You are in the commercial sector over here. Make no mistake about that, and we'll talk later on during the course about social ventures and impact investing and all that kind of good stuff, right? But an entrepreneur, in essence, is working in Adam Smith's world with the invisible hand in the commercial enterprise business, right? But there are two words here, business and businesses, because it turns out that if you do this, the people who really do this are serial entrepreneurs, and they tend to do one or more. They, after they do their first one, they tend to keep going and do more businesses over there, over here. What's the next line? Well, taking on a greater than normal, stop right there. Greater than normal. We're not normal. We're abnormal. By definition, entrepreneurs are abnormal people. And they voluntarily take on, they're masochists. They take on greater. They're greater in some way. What are they greater? They're taking on greater than normal what? Challenges. Financial risks. And here's another thing, right? You're not talking about the risk of, this is not bungee jumping or whatever, or sitting in front of a speeding railroad car. Financial risk. You're putting money, your money, somebody else's money, on top of your money, at risk over here. So an entrepreneur is a person who op organizes and operates a business or businesses, taking on greater than normal financial risks to do so. Keep that in the back of your mind as we go through. All right, well, now go back a little bit and talk about Adam Smith, who we, who we mentioned before, right? So Adam Smith, sort of the, the father of, of uh, modern capitalist economics, um, says that the free market is going to produce exactly what we need, the right amount and variety of goods operated by this invisible hand, which is based on everybody doing, these entrepreneurs, what is right for him or herself. And if, therefore, if you self-optimize in this giant ecosystem, this global ecosystem over here, by pursuing your own interests, that ultimately you will do a much more efficient job at this than if somebody set up there and mandated the entire world. And that's the key to modern capitalist entrepreneurial economics. Now, the father of entrepreneurship, so if Smith was the father of capitalism, the father of uh, entrepreneurship is this guy, Joseph Schumpeter. And Schumpeter was the guy who, turned, who took the idea of entrepreneurship and said that an entrepreneur takes an idea. He's not necessarily an inventor. Somebody else can invent a new thing. But an entrepreneur is somebody who takes an invention and turns it into an innovation. And thereby doing, entrepreneurs will result in creative destruction of things that already exist. And that's where the term creative destruction comes from. Because this, you are, remember, you're going outside the market you are redirecting resources to create something that doesn't exist, and the result of that is to blow up things that do because you figured out a way to do it better, faster, and cheaper over here. 
And so therefore, creative destruction is the essence of dynamism and the creation of new markets. So what does it take to be an entrepreneur? It takes a whole set of specialized skills and characteristics and abilities, some innate, some learned. First of all, it's people management, because no matter how you do this, you ultimately have to get other people to follow you. You can try and put a zillion dollars and bribe them, but if you don't lead them, if you don't inspire them, if you can't manage all these resources, your profit network or, or your team to do this, it's not going to work. Then after that, you've got to be able to be good at whatever it is your company is doing, the production. You got to whether you're producing a widget or producing a website or producing a service, you have to be able to produce. Okay? Number three, in addition to the mechanics of production, you have to be able to operate a business, an enterprise, right? Whether that's an all-in-one company today, whether it's a far-flung organization, the organizational aspects of maintaining an enterprise is something that is a critical entrepreneurial skill. And then you have to be able to figure out how to finance this thing because it all comes down to dollars and cents. The essence of an entrepreneurial business is functioning within this capitalist system and you have to get, have, create a profit long term over here. And you, one of the reasons you do that is by actually selling what it is you do. So if you are somebody who can do wonderful production and have, has a great idea but can't figure out how to get anybody to buy what it is you're selling, you're going to fail. And so therefore, an entrepreneur has to have the ability to sell or at least work with people, with sales teams who can sell there. And then finally, you've got to be able to figure out how to get your business financed, whether it's by bootstrapping yourself, by putting in your own capital, by getting debt capital, by raising money from other people. We'll have a whole session on startup financing. But all these skills are critical in terms of being an entrepreneur. There are lots and lots of books on entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship turns out to be the underpinning of our existing capitalist economy over here. Um, one really interesting book is by this guy. His name is Scott Shane. Um, and he wrote a book called The Illusions of Entrepreneurship, which is all about um, things that people think about entrepreneurs that aren't actually true. And there are a lot of myths. The, there are probably more myths about entrepreneurship than there are about anything except maybe being an NBA basketball star. You would ask any kid in, in you know, fifth grade uh, kid in an inner city school, and they're all to grow up to be a basketball star. Now, the number of them who grow up to be basketball stars are actually, actually about zero, right? Um, and by the same token, we all read you know, TechCrunch and so on and, and other things, and, and uh, America has this, this dream of entrepreneurship. It means different things to different people, and we'll talk about what some of that is. But let's talk about how you get to be an entrepreneur. Um, there's a, some people believe it's purely genetic, right? This guy named Thomas Harrison, um, who has, uh, has, has written a book um, called Instinct, which is all about how to figure out if you're sort of an entrepreneurial native um, and then to leverage those skills into doing this. But I think the most interesting um, book on the subject, and I have it on the reading list, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's really instructive, is by this guy. Um, this guy's name is John Gartner. He is a uh, psychology professor at Hopkins. And he was working on a book um, about the, uh, psychi the intersection between psychiatry and religion. And his, his thesis was to figure out when you know, people who are visionaries or prophets or saints or whatever it is, you know, was there anything psychiatrically, psychologically in their makeup that uh, you know, Joan of Arc is leading the, the children's crusade or whatever is, you know, was, was she hearing voices from God or was she just schizophrenic and was she, hearing, was she just nuts? And he was looking around for, for different populations that might share similar psychiatric um, symptoms. And he saw a cover of uh, um, Newsweek magazine, and there was a picture of Bill Gross. This was during the uh, 19, uh, 2000 crash. And the cover picture of Bill Gross, the headline was, this man just lost $8 billion. Why is he smiling? <clears throat> and so Gartner said, hmm, maybe these entrepreneurial types um, you know, have, uh, have something in common. And so he went into the psychiatric literature and looked at all kinds of definitions and all kinds of symptoms. And he, he came up with, with, with one draft idea about uh, uh, a, a particular um, set of symptoms. And he, he sent around a little test survey to a bunch of the biggest entrepreneurs he could find. You know, half a dozen guys, Craig Venter and Steve Jobs and folks like that. And he said, you know, here are these like, you know, 17 symptoms. I'm just curious, we're doing an academic test. Could you tell me on a scale of one to five if any of these, you know, describe you? And what were they? Uh, well, let's say you're filled with energy. Uh, you're flooded with ideas. Um, 
you uh, are driven, you're restless, you can't stay still. Um, you, 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 you have your energy to, to be channeling to wildly grand ideas to, to change the world. You, you don't have to get a whole lot of sleep over here. Um, you are you brilliant, you're special, you're chosen, you're, 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 you can be euphoric, you live, you, you can have a major impact on society over here. Um, on the other hand, if, if you know, the little people get in your way, you, know, you just want to get, get rid of them and, and just go through to see this all happen. You, you, you take risks to, to, to do this, you tend to be spending money too fast, both in your personal life and your, and your business life. Um, you occasionally can act impulsively over here. Um, you fa are fa you're fast talking. Um, <clears throat> you're witty and gregarious. Uh, you, you're charismatic. You're persuasive. Um, uh, and occasionally, you <clears throat> make enemies and people who aren't quite as smart as you. you know, so he sent this, this thing out. Just, just out of curiosity, do any of these things meet you? And he said the results he got back were absolutely mind-blowing. Typically, in a psychiatric survey like this, you'll get back things that are you know, within the standard deviation of the norm a little bit. You know, you need a big sample to see. He said the results were like, on a scale of one to five, 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 seven! Yes, this is me, 100% over here. <clears throat> so what was the psychiatric definition for all these traits? Close, close, close. It's called... Hypomania. Now, hypomania is a psychiatric definition. Hypo, you know, hyper means more than, hypo means less than. The diff and mania is the, as you point out, the top end of bipolar. Bipolar used to be called manic depression. Manic on the top, depression at the bottom. So if you're manic, that's uh, by itself, you don't be bipolar, you can be manic all the time, and you're, you're just as psychiatrically um, deformed as somebody who is bipolar over here, right? Um, the interesting thing is the difference between mania, which is a psychopathy, a, a, uh, a um, pathological psychiatric definition where you are not functional, where you really need to be locked up in, in a straitjacket or put under heavy duty medication or whatever. That's mania, that's the top end of, of bipolar. The dif diagnostic difference between mania and hypomania is one thing. Everything in that entire list is exactly true of both manics and hypomanics. And the one line differentiation is that hypomanics are functional. So basically, if you have all those things too much, you should be locked up and, and medicated. <clears throat> but if you have just enough of them <clears throat> to, to, to still be able to function, then you're hypomanic, and that turns um, into something that makes a lot of sense. So his book is entitled um, The Hypomanic Edge, How a Little Bit of Craziness Equals a Lot of Success. Um, and so I would posit that I think that's actually a very good definition. Now, I wouldn't know anybody <coughs> like that, of course, um, although, although since, since um, you know, I was one of the admissions folks who did all of your things over here, we were selecting in this group precisely for, not how many, but at least entrepreneurship. So that was in addition to academics and, and grand challenge experience and global background, we were, all of you were chosen here for, in some way, your entrepreneurial tendencies. So how many of you, out of curiosity, think that you are at least partly hypomanic? <laughs> okay, look around, right? Look at the entire class. There, there you go. That's one of the reasons why this group is so special. So if you, if you think about, about what it takes to be an entrepreneur, that's, you know, it's like oxygen to a fire. That's necessary, but not sufficient. There's a wonderful book by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. Anybody here read Outliers? Um, if you haven't, you really should. It's a wonderful, Gladwell's a brilliant thinker, and it's a great book. And, and, and in Outliers, he goes through what makes special people really special. And it turns out that you know, if you're to be Bill Gates or to be the Beatles or whatever it is, it's not necessarily that you were a, a, a like most sort of pure gift from God and you were you know, one in a, in, a, in a billion. There are a whole bunch of things that go into making somebody an outlier. Part of it is, is the natural God-given stuff, and part of it is environment and everything else. And so therefore, I would posit that to be a really good, successful entrepreneur, all the conditions here are, on the one hand, you have to be hypomanic enough. You don't have to be over the top. You don't have to be manic. You don't even have to be the world's ultimate functional hypomanic. You just have to have just enough hypomania to be able to drive the rest of it over here, right? Um, then it's really helpful if you have a cultural tradition of entrepreneurship. Now, that's a very big change. We have people from 35 countries in this room right now. Now, the U.S. absolutely has a cultural tradition of entrepreneurship. Other countries, particularly in the Middle East and some countries in, in older parts of Europe, don't have it at all. And that's a real problem if you're trying to be an entrepreneur. I've been on a number of occasions called to, to the UK to work with the UK government on saying, how can we foster an entrepreneurial environment such as you have in the US? 
Well, you know, it turns out that in, in, in certain parts of the UK, um, if you fail in a business, you're like prohibited from ever raising money again. You can, for 10 years, you can't start a business, be a director of a company if the business fails. Well, you know, your, your people, you know, shun your children in the street. You've, you've put a big blot in the family escutcheon. I mean, if you, if you fail, what kind of message is society sending if you try and take a chance and you fail? and then you are forever damned. Well, that's the you know, pretty big price to pay, right? The risk-reward ratio doesn't really work in favor of trying new things. Whereas here, you're not in the heart of, of Silicon Valley. Over here, failure is a badge of honor. If you, haven't, if you go pitch a VC and you haven't failed before, they'll say, well, where were you? Why, why, didn't you, why weren't you trying new kinds of things? Um, so a cultural tradition of supporting entrepreneurship is really interesting. And Gartner, in his book, after going through the hypomanic question, says, well, you know, if this is really, really is sort of genetically, you know, psychiatrically derived, can we trace back populations and see what happens? Well, it turns out that the ultimate form of entrepreneurship is what? Is actually picking up and leaving your home country, creating a whole new world, new life, new business in another place. And that's immigration. So we said, well, can we check and, and correlate countries with large immigrant populations with large entrepreneurial populations? Well, it turns out that the most entrepreneurial countries in the world, the US, Australia, um, Israel, <laughs> um, you know, places like that that actually have um, large histories of, of immigration. Very, very interesting. So you want a cultural tradition that supports entrepreneurship. Um, then it helps if you know somebody who has been an entrepreneur. I was uh, a friend of mine um, said he had a, uh, a young person he knew who was finishing his doctoral studies, moving to New York, and was looking for a job. Could I interview him and see if I can make any recommendations? And I'm talking to, to this guy, and uh, he's very clearly very bright and articulate, and, I'm, and my little antennae are, 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 are tingling. And, he, and he's talking about that, and I'm saying, you know, boy, have you ever thought of, uh, you know, uh, starting a, a, a product or starting a company? And he said, no. I said, uh, well, you, you sort of sound like an entrepreneur to me. I mean, do you have anybody in your family an entrepreneur? He said, no, my parents are both academics and so on and so forth. Um, so I said, all right, you know what? I'm getting, my spider sense tells me that you are a natural entrepreneur, so I'm going to make you, I'm going to hire you, not as my entrepreneur in residence, but my entrepreneur in training, in my EIT. And so we're going to see if I'm right. So I hired a man, and son of a gun, he turns out to be, he's, he's, he writes me a business plan for a product that he'd never thought about a business plan, never thought about a product before, but based on his academic work, all of a sudden, here's the, one of the best business plans I've ever seen in terms of hitting a market and so on and so forth. So, you, but, but nobody in his life had ever been an entrepreneur. He didn't know that this was a, a you know, all you see is Donald Trump over there, right? Well, on the, on, on the one hand, it helps societally if you have role models like, uh, like Donald Trump or, or other people in on TV. But if you have somebody who you respect, your role models, your mentors over there, and you've seen somebody do it before, particularly for women, they, you know, the number of entrepreneurs who are women are, are much smaller than they should be because they're in the previous generation, there are very few women. And so, but if you have a, a mother or a sister or a friend or a teacher or a mentor um, who has done it and has shown you that, that uh, whether it's an Esther Dyson or Linda Holiday or Mary Kay Ash or a um, Carly Fiorina or a, um, you know, anybody, who, Meg Whitman, people who have done this, you can do it too. And so that helps to, to, to inspire you there. You then need to have the opportunity. And it's really, you know, in, increasingly all this technology is making it easier and easier for people to have entrepreneurial opportunities. But if you're in a you know, little village in the outskirts of, um, you know, of Botswana, it's very hard, than, much harder than if you're here sitting in Mountain View in a coffee shop and, and there are opportunities to start new things. You're around a whole entrepreneurial fervor over here. Um, and then with all those things in place, um, you have to sort of know the mechanics. This says, I've got all this energy here and, 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 and ready to do it and I'm inspired, but how do I do it? And entrepreneurship is a very unforgiving kind of life to live. And it really helps if you have training. And a study just done by Babson College came out last week um, showed that people who have taken at least two courses in entrepreneurship are much, much more likely to start companies and to succeed at having successful companies because there is stuff that you can learn. So let's talk for a minute about if you've decided to be an entrepreneur. And raise your hands. How many of you think you are going to be entrepreneurs in some way, shape, or form? Well, it's 100% of the class. Good. Then our, our admissions stuff was done correctly because that's what we, we, were, we were hiring over here, right? So let me tell you what you're getting into, right? So the entrepreneurial life is not a bed of roses. Um, uh, it, is, it is really tough um, because on the, on the one hand, um, you're, the challenges that you face are, are truly enormous because you are doing something that doesn't exist. By definition, remember, you're overriding the market. So what happens there? Well, 
it takes work. It doesn't have, you know, you, there are all these things, oh, somebody was just sitting in, a, in an apple, hit him on the head, and he created a social network, and now he's got a billion dollars. It doesn't work. Everybody behind all these people is work, work, work. As Thomas Edison, the greatest inventor of the 20th century, um, said, you know, um, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. In other words, you have the idea, but then you've got to bust your ass to make this all work. Um, next, uh, <clears throat> dedication. Perseverance. You have to say, this is all in. This is because you are going against the existing norms, commercial norms and, and maybe societal norms. You are creating something new. It takes real perseverance to bull through this. And that's one of the things that we look for in an entrepreneur when, when we're investing. We want to see somebody who's not in it for just a, a, a quickie, who's not in it uh, if it's easy. It's going to be tough. It's going to be really, really tough over here. Um, so if you, if you, you have to be dedicated to doing it, you've got to persevere uh, in doing it. And when you do that and when you succeed, it is exhilarating. I tell you, there is nothing, nothing that is as, as personally rewarding and as you know, the top end of, of, the, of the manic spectrum over here. When you've created something against the grain, you're, you're, you're envisioning something new, you're making it happen, you're seeing it work, you're getting adoption on your social network or people are buying your product over here. That is an insanely wonderful, exhilarating feeling. On the other hand, when things don't go right, which they will not go right 90% of the time, it is agonizing. It is really awful. It is really, really bad. So if you're not prepared to handle the agony over here, you know, you shouldn't be in this business because I guarantee you it will be agonizing. ABC's Wild World of Sports, the opening showed, you know, uh, jumpers and ski jumpers, you know, the thrill of victory and the ag agony of defeat. And there really is agony over here. Um, okay, well, what else? Uh, the accomplishment, the sense of having created something. Creation is really, really key. That's why people get into the business in order to, to create. And once you have created something, it gives you an extraordinary sense of accomplishment over here. Um, on the other hand, you will fail. And, and when you fail, the ability to handle failure is critical. So if you get out there and, and your, your first product doesn't work, well, you know, boom, you're dead. Pandora's first product didn't work. Um, the, uh, a lot of stuff out there didn't work. The Apple III, Steve Jobs' successor to the Apple II, was, a, was effectively a, a failure. You have to be able, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two imposters just the same, that's a quote from Rudyard Kipling's <laughs> poem, If, over there, you've got to be able to, to, to deal with that. Um, uh, and to do this requires sacrifice, right? Um, sacrifice not only from you, but also from your family. Um, because you give up, on the one hand, sense of control, you, have, you are powerless to do, to do with these forces that are coming on top of you. On the other hand, you actually have the ability to control your own destiny because you're, you're in charge. So it's a yin and a yang. As an, as an entrepreneur, you are faced on the one hand, nobody tells you what to do. You've got to tell yourself what to do. You can decide to go into this market or that market to build this, hire this person, create this, this product over here. On the other hand, whether you succeed or fail is to a large part dependent on whether others will buy your product, what other people in the marketplace are doing over here, the competitive nature, um, and, and doing all this, the sacrifices um, that it takes on yourself personally in terms of time and energy and, 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 and life and the sacrifices you have to make in terms of your family, and make no mistake, there will be sacrifices. There is no such thing as an entrepreneur with a purely happy spouse, um, because the, the business must, at some point, come first. And that's a really hard thing to say. I and mean, believe me, I am first and foremost a father, and second a husband, and only third an entrepreneur. But boy, are there trade-offs in life when you try and, and, uh, and, and get your, your company going here. So you feel powerless, but at the end of the day, um, you end up with uh, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary satisfaction for making this work. Can we get the monitor fixed over here, please? Um, so, all right, at this point, boom, I'm going to have a, a commercial. And this commercial is, I'm going to drop in a whole other presentation here. That this one was actually went online last week um, by a woman named Tara Hunt, uh, who is a, an entrepreneur, uh, Canadian entrepreneur, used to be in California, um, and uh, she wrote a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation, which it struck me was absolutely perfect for this audience. So I am going to just run through her presentation. Imagine me as a really attractive thirty-something uh, uh, over here, um, uh, talking about uh, what we have. So, so this is this is her uh, uh, Twitter handle is at Miss Rogue. So you can credit her with, uh, with some, some of these slides. Um, so here's what she has to say about, so you want to start, start a startup. Ha, ha, ha. OK. Um, first of all, it's hard. It is really hard. I mean, 
It is heartbreakingly hard over here. Um, it is soul crushing. It takes your whole life out of you over here. It is life shortening. This is not an easy road to hoe. If you choose to be an entrepreneur, it's not going to be a lot of fun. You look at the papers, you look at the magazines, you see all these wonderful entrepreneurs on the top of all these covers, all these magazines making $60 zillion, the next web phenomenon, so on and so forth. You see headlines in TechCrunch and elsewhere about so and so got 40 million bucks in financing. You've got, you know, Groupon refuses billions of dollars in offering over here. Well, you know what? That's not reality. That doesn't happen. That happens to one out of 10,000 people over there. That's not going to happen to you. So here are some of the myths about startups. One, we, <clears throat> people like me will tell you startups cost nothing to build, and the price of, of startups is dropping exponentially, and costs, everything's going to IT, IT is going to free, everything's all free. Yeah, um, but um, <clears throat> that's not quite always the case. Um, you hear things like the average dropout, you know, the average founder is a Mark Zuckerberg dropping out of Harvard over here. Not true. Um, that you get funded on a napkin by a VC sitting at Starbucks over here. That you, know, you have a great idea and that's enough to do it. That you know, location is, is getting less important, but doesn't matter. So let's go through some of the facts over here, right? So <clears throat> this is her line, and I will have to at some point uh, agree with this, right? Um, so yes, the cost of starting a company is dropping, but it's not free at this point. It will, and even if it's not taking you, my first company took me 20 million bucks in VC to get to our internet product ship. My second company cost me 2 million in VC to get to our internet product ship. When I started investing as an angel, my first investment took us 200,000 bucks to get to internet product ship. And then as I showed you, Pond5, when we invested a couple of years ago, took 20,000 bucks. So that's three orders of magnitude dropping down, which is really cool. However, you will find that the Pond5 is the outlier. It will likely take you, whatever you're doing in the real world, some hundreds of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of bucks. Maybe if you're doing a really big thing, it's going to be really scalable, a million bucks. Most people in this room don't have a hundred thousand bucks or a million bucks in your pocket to do it, which means you've got to raise it. So it's not cheap. You've got to pay for really great, talented people. Even if you can, through your leadership, get them onto your team for equity, you still got to pay them salaries. You've got hosting costs, and even though they're dropping and everything else over here. Um, so it's really challenging. It does cost money. Um, and you don't have to be an Ivy League dropout. As a matter of fact, most of the, of the great entrepreneurs over there um, were, were not. Uh, they, they do tend to be overwhelmingly male, which is a, a challenge we're trying to solve. I'm working with Astia and other organizations to support and encourage women entrepreneurship. But the bottom line is anybody can be an entrepreneur, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like over here. But the really important thing here is this is not easy. This is really not easy. Let there be absolutely no question about this. You will feel that you are screwed 24-7. This is because you are going against the market. You are doing something that doesn't exist. You are creating something over there. And it's not just every great idea wins. It's a great idea, plus a whole, whole lot of luck and timing and perseverance. <laughs> balls of steel. She asked her it's balls of steel because she said boobs of steel didn't sound really good even though she's a woman over here. Um, so the, the, the trick to doing this um, is to, you know, you got to find your market. You got to get your product going and hit that, that hockey stick curve before you run out of money. And that's really simple. So you can have the world's most brilliant idea, but until you find your market, until you find your fit, you are living on the edge in the valley of death, as we call it, between funding and the time when you can actually break even over there. And so you know, the question is, if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, are you ready to make the ultimate sacrifice? Because that's what this is. This is your life, and this is your family, and this is your psyche, and this is your soul. And the answer had better be yes, because all told, it's not just about working hard, okay? It's working hard, and working hard, and working harder, and dedicating yourself, and hitting the timing, and being lucky, and having everything else around you work. And it's, you know, on the one hand, it is this extraordinary exhilaration on the other hand, it's really extraordinarily uh, agonizing. And the answer is, there is nothing that is necessarily fair about entrepreneurship. I have seen plenty of great entrepreneurs who just didn't do it. One of the people we're actually going to uh, have come this summer and talk to you, and I think you'll really, really love it, is the guy who invented social networking and patented it. Literally has a US patent on social networking. He created the first social networking site, and I will save the story for what happened, and where it is, and who owns the patent, and the whole bit, un until he comes. But suffice to say, it's not Mark Zuckerberg. <clears throat> um, so there are, if you go look in history, right? You know, Nikola Tesla and, and Edison. 
Tesla died broke in a hotel room. Um, Edison died rich and, and honored. Both brilliant guys, both ahead of their time, both far thinking over here. Um, it is not fair. You can do everything right and still go broke. My first company um, had a brilliant idea, but you know what? The timing was off. We were ahead of our market on this one. We, we got tens of millions of bucks in venture capital. We had a killer product, all kinds of awards. It's in the Smithsonian Institution. Um, it got a full Walt Mossberg column in the Wall Street Journal for a breakthrough product. Um, we got partners with, with, with Compaq and NEC and, and Philips and, and all kinds of people. HP built things to our design, and we were just too much ahead of the market. And so the whole thing crashed and burned. But we restarted as an entrepreneur. And our second company, using some of the same technology, this time we learned our lessons. So we, we instead of have betting on one technology um, and, and one set of content, we actually created a platform for the mobile internet, a global platform to be able to take any kind of, like an app store, any kind of content, any kind of device, any kind of anything, put it together, add an advertising, brilliant concept. We actually then got funded. We, we did a, a, a term sheet at a 60 million um, round at 120 million pre-money valuation. Went out globally. Hired the top guy from a number three guy from IBM, who was actually Mark Bregman, who was here last night, um, to, uh, to to run this this enterprise. Expanded into internationally. With um, we were based in the UK and in France and in Germany and the US, heading to Asia. The you know so this was a brilliant idea. We were way ahead of our time. But you know what? <clears throat> Only one thing could possibly have killed us. Well, that would be the unthinkable thing of like you know, tsunami. Well, imagine if the entire internet collapsed like overnight and the entire mobile market collapsed overnight, right? Well, guess what happened in the year 2000? It did, right? Um, so, <laughs> poof, my entire brilliant operation, brilliant plan, brilliant technology, brilliant everything. You know, phew, boom, okay? And yeah, crash and burn. So you'll learn from that. And so you could do everything right and you could still screw up. And these are her slides, but they apply to mostly all entrepreneurs over here, right? Because entrepreneurs aren't just in it for the fame and fortune. You hope you get that. But there has to be something more than that, right? So the question is, why? Why in this agonizing world where things aren't fair and you can lose all your money and your family yells at you and, it's, and, it's, and it can be soul-searing, why the hell do you do this? <clears throat> yeah. So... Her answer is the answer you will hear from every real entrepreneur, right? Which is, you can't imagine doing anything else. Unhealthy, but a beautifully necessary obsession. Because if you are a real entrepreneur at your core, you've got to do this. I don't know if you remember the movie Singing in the Rain with Gene Kelly, who plays a hoofer, a dancer from, from Chicago, comes to New York. Why? Gotta dance, gotta dance. He, he, he has to dance. He's a dancer, he has to dance. Same thing for an entrepreneur. You gotta start a company. That's what you gotta do. No matter how many times you get hit, you're gonna pick it up and, and do it again. So I so now that's the end of Tara's presentation. We'll go back to my presentation over here, right? <clears throat> Which is what is the entrepreneurial spectrum? I think that everybody, whether you're hypomanic or not, there is a whole spectrum here of, 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 of people who have a, a soul for entrepreneurship. And on the one hand, you have the naturals. And you know who these people are, right? You go all the way down, people who are, who are you know, not quite naturals, but they're, they're ready. They're, they're primed to be entrepreneurs. You know, then there are people who are potentially, if they had the right environment, the right nurture, nutrient agar, and the right uh, education, and so on and so forth. Then there are people who are, you know, you know well, they're a little fearful of that entrepreneurship, and so they would not do this on their own, or even if they had the opportunity. Uh, and then there are people, you know, you know <laughs> never, never would ever, ever do this kind of thing. And again, these, are, these are, are types who you have met in your life, right? So you know, who are they? Well, Richard Branson. You ever seen Richard Branson? Talk about hypomanic. I mean, not only dyslexic, but I mean, here's a guy who lives risk-taking, um, you know, lives large, changed the world. Um, pure, natural-born entrepreneur. There are a lot of people like that. Steve Jobs, not quite that, that manic level, but clearly a natural-born entrepreneur. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who, you know, you, you couldn't, you know, put bamboo shoots under their fingernails and they wouldn't do this. My wonderful wife, who I love and adore and have been married to for almost 30 years, um, highly accomplished, highly smart, low degree, all kinds of other things. The idea of starting a company or running a company for her is so anathema, you know, she thinks I'm from another planet over here. So that's why I married her. It takes all types to, to make this work. There is something to be said, though, for the type who would run a company versus the type that would start a company. Absolutely. The, then that's the question of founders versus managers. When an entrepreneur manages to, to start the company, but not just start it, not just be a founder, have an idea, right? So for example, 
eBay. eBay was started by a guy named Pierre Meillard, who was a product manager at Apple, who had the idea for an online exchange of, of Pez dispensers. His wife collected Pez dispensers. And he started the company as a founder. He's not an entrepreneur in that sense. He's a founder. He did a wonderful job, but he was smart enough to know that that wasn't his thing, his shtick, to be an entrepreneur. So he brought in Meg Whitman, who was the one who took the company as a manager who didn't start the company really large. So it's possible, absolutely, to have teams and pairs of people to do that. But a true entrepreneur is you know, the, the natural born ones like Richard Branson. But you know what? Most people are not Richard Branson. Most people are actually somewhere in the middle over here. And the role of entrepreneurship courses and entrepreneurship programs like this at SU is not to make you something that you aren't, but to help people move along the spectrum. And so that's the idea here is if you are somebody who would be never think about doing an entrepreneurial activity in your life, but you understand how it works and what it's about, maybe, just maybe, you can actually get to the stage where you could work for an entrepreneurial company that might not necessarily be around 10 years from now. And if you're the kind of person who is you know, fearful about this, but you might take a job at, at Google, well, maybe we can help you get to the point where you could you know, take a job at a, at a startup um, and, and begin to, to, to see that there's a potential over here. And then if you're the kind of person who's working at a startup, um, whoa, you know, we want to try and get you ready to take the next step when you have it all there. And if you happen to be one of those people who is a, a natural entrepreneur, the, our goal here is to give you the skills and the tools to absolutely shoot into the sky. So what is it about entrepreneurs, whether they are in business entrepreneurs or whether they are in other kinds of areas over there, is that they think differently. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Thank you. OK, questions? Um, so I'd like to start off just with an observation and comment. Uh, when, I, when you were talking about the entrepreneurial life, one of the things that I noticed uh, from being a non-Silicon Valley entrepreneur is there's one thing that I thought that might be missing, and that it's really lonely to be an entrepreneur sometimes. Absolutely. And I actually got pretty emotional during that talk because, uh, you know, you put up this, um, I forget the name of the person who, who created the slides, but it's about how heartbreaking it can be, how difficult it can be. and. And all these people around me were like, yeah, I understand that. And for the first, I mean, it's, I've never been around so many entrepreneurs that, that understand the, the really tough, how tough it is, right? So I just wanted to thank the students for being here and the organizers for making this happen because it's really amazing. It's really amazing to, to be able to share these experiences. You are not alone. Yay. <laughs> So, okay, so, my, so um, in the last talk, you were talking about how, you know, businesses are getting smaller, there's more and more ideas. So I wanted to present uh, a scenario for you uh, to see what you would do. Um, so you're going around your everyday business. Oh, by the way, this scenario should be very familiar to pretty much everyone, right? You're going around your everyday business, and you stumble across a burning customer need, something that you're like, wow, and your intuition is saying, this could be really big, this could be game-changing, right? So you're really excited, you sp start speaking to people, and it turns out that people have this need and they're willing to pay for it. So you're like, oh my God, I'm in the next Facebook, this is amazing, it's gonna be viral. And so, um, so you go to the internet and you do a couple of searches and you figure out there's a couple of companies that already have that, had that idea, and you can tell they're not big. I mean, you know, their SEO is rubbish, and you, know, you, can, you can just tell it's a really early stage startup. Um, what do you do? Do you kind of abandon your idea and say, well, there's a couple of companies already on it? Or do you go for it and kind of try and outcompete or 
Uh, you, you try and make the most rational decision an entrepreneur can make. And entrepreneurs never make rational decisions because by definition we are irrational people, right? But in this case, I will guarantee you that any idea you have, somebody else has had, right? right. So there are, you know, six billion people in the world. And it really um, sucks, right? And, and, and like, even oh, if I'm going to be so you know, rich. And then you're like, oh. Well, but, but any idea, I mean, I mean literally as, a, as, an, as an angel investor, right, you know, I probably see a thousand business plans a year. The, the big VC funds, the Sequoias and Kleiner Perkins will see 10,000 plans a year. You think there are 10,000 new ideas a year? No, they're not. I mean, as an example, we, there's a whole category of, um, of, of premium uh, uh, vodkas, right? So uh, it turns out that that's actually a high-end you know, beverage market. So in New York Angels, although we are a tech-focused company, um, we had somebody present us with an idea for a premium rum brand. Well, that's really an interesting idea, but you know what? Um, we didn't just get one premium. That same month, we got a second premium rum idea for New York Angels. And you know what? The same month, we got a third premium rum idea. So we had three people pitching us premium rums to a technology-focused angel investing group in New York. You know? So any idea you have, somebody else somewhere in the world has had. So the question is, all the other things that flow into that, do you have the domain expertise, or can you get it? Do you have some kind of secret sauce, some kind of competitive advantage over them? Can you execute better? Do you have a better vision to how to tweak this directly? I mean, Mark Zuckerberg didn't invent social networking, not even close. He wasn't the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, but he actually hit, the timing was right, and he had a vision how to do it, and he really executed. So the answer is, if you think this is right, just because there are three other startups out there, if you believe that you know what they're doing wrong and you can do it better, go for it. And um, what do you say to the, you know, the angel investor when you're pitching the idea? Do you kind of reveal all these sites? You have to. Absolutely. You have to. Absolutely. Because if you don't, I guarantee you, they will say, well, how about this side, that's the other side. Remember, the odds are they have seen a whole lot more than you have. I've seen a thousand pitches this year, right? So I, there is almost every single case a company comes in and pitches me, and I'll ask them about a competitor that they didn't know they had because I know a whole lot. And you have to assume that although the potential investor doesn't know everything about your business, They've got a pretty good idea and they've heard of or they know of or if they, they read or they play in the, in the real world, they will have seen somebody else out there. So yes, you have to go through your competitors and then tell us why you're different, why you're better. Are they doing the exact same thing? If you're doing the exact same thing, what is going to make you succeed and then fail? That you got to convince me on. I'm Rachel. I'm from around here from Menlo Park. I was wondering, it obviously takes a lot of perseverance and stubbornness to start a company. And how do you know when it's time to keep pushing on and when you should throw in the towel and move on to the next thing? And that's always a really challenging um, question. How do you know when it's time to, to, to bag it? And the answer is, it's not time yet, but the time ultimately comes. When my first company, as I told you, you know, crashed and burned because we were ahead of our time, and I was willing, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, so I was willing to persevere and commit, and I was willing to, to, to beg it. I told my investors, I'll work without salary for a year, I'll move to the UK, I'll do whatever I have to do, I will run this, I will not let you down, I will do it. Um, and my investors were saying, you know, we've given it a shot, the world's crashing, you know, enough, enough. My, my father, my mentor, my role model, one of the wisest guys I know, um, uh, said, the Seminole Indians in Florida, have a way of catching alligators who they, they eat for meat and stuff. They take a log and they stick it in the water and the alligator comes along and goes thinking it's food. And the alligator is not going to let that go. And so you know what they do? They just pull the log out of the water and the alligator comes along with it. There are times to let go. Um, uh, you can clamp on too hard um, and that was his suggestion was that it was time for me to, to, to let it go. Side note about my father. Um, during the, the uh, dot-com boom, uh, I was a finalist for the Entrepreneur of the Year uh, Award, the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in, in New York uh, in 99 or thereabouts. My father won it three years ago. Um, you know, he's now 83. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying to my father, hello, tacky, get out of the way. Next generation is coming up. You know, uh, you know old guys aren't supposed to be winning Entrepreneur of the Year Awards kind of thing. But in, in any event, um, so th there are times it's always going to be longer than you think. It's like a runner with hitting the wall in a marathon. You have to break through the wall. Now, if, you, if your legs are broken and you, and you drop dead, you know, I guess that's time. On the other hand, if you're Tiger Woods, you play through a broken leg and you actually make it and win the, win the championship, right? So it, it's, it's longer than you think it is, but it's not forever. And you have to have some bit of rationality and some good advisors and some people who can look from the outside and give you some advice. The call will ultimately have to be yours, but it should be done rationally plus. Do you have any specific criteria, like looking at, say, the market 
or anything in specific, any specific criteria that you use to determine? No, I mean, it, again, it, it's all case specific. So it depends on, on what you're doing. So, but I mean, if, you, if you've got something and, you, and you've got your early adopters, there's a wonderful book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. I didn't put it on the reading list, but I probably should. Um, it's a really great book for entrepreneurs about market entry. Crossing the Chasm, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y-M-O-O-R-E. Um, and the point he makes is that it's actually very easy to get the early adopters, the innovators, the, the first people to try your beta site who think this is really cool, send you all these wonderful mash notes saying you've got the greatest thing around, right? But then to get to the mainstream users over there is really, really tricky. Um, and that's the chasm. And so, you know, if you've got the early adopters, but you can't get over that chasm, no matter what you're trying, you try pivoting and you try going here and you try going there, and you can't get any kind of adoption and your, and your, your rates, you know, your adoptions are going like here with the early adopters, and then they're here, and then you're seeing people begin to drop off and go like this. If you can't figure out how to get that curve up, at some point when you're down here, that probably is, is time to, uh, to bag it. On the other hand, if you just can't go anymore, you're out of funds, you're in the valley of death. The valley of death is that point in time between your funding and when you're out of funding because you're not profitable yet. Um, if you hit the, the wall, um, then it's time to bag it. So, so try and get the best advice you can, look rationally at it, go a little bit more, but then ultimately be realistic. Thanks. Hi, I'm Justine from uh, the Bay Area. And my question is, uh, you mentioned the need to put business ahead of family. And as a woman wannabe entrepreneur, are there any examples of other women that have been able to juggle both family and children with their businesses? And how do they do this? This, is, this isn't necessarily a male-female question. This, this really is a time stage of life question and a family question. Um, and, and, you know, the, the world is changing very rapidly. We are getting much more uh, egalitarian. Um, and these are these questions about family and you know, work-life balance are affecting everybody, men and well as women. There still is a preponderance of the issues for, for women. I mean, I've got, I'm invested in probably 20% women entrepreneurs um, uh, who tend to have who tend to have these challenges. But these are real challenges, and and there is no easy answer on this one. Um, and and this is where you know people who mentor entrepreneurs are always faced with the challenges of of what to say because on the one hand you you want to say. You're an entrepreneur. You have to have the courage of your convictions. You're going to go against you know, creative destruction. You're going to see things the market doesn't see. You must believe it. Everybody tells you you're wrong. Go and do it anyway. Have the power of, of, of your vision over there. Except if I tell you that it's a really bad idea, don't do it over here, right? I mean, so, so how do you, you know, well, with all the things that I've seen, all the experience, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm, you know, my, my track record is pretty good about saying, looking at fact patterns and saying, okay, you know, I've seen this, this hand play out 17 times before. Every time it's failed, I can get a read on you as an entrepreneur. You're really not going to cut it. You really don't know what you're doing. You don't have the domain expertise. So, you know what? You know, I know you think you're brilliant and you got the, the world's greatest idea, but I, you know, I'll bet you 99 cents to a, dollar, to a penny that it's going to you know, fail. Okay, how does that jive with my, with my other here saying, have the power of your convictions and, and you know, it doesn't matter what the naysayers say, you know, they're all wrong, you can go do it. That's a problem. By the same token, in terms of, of work-life balance, um, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, I'm telling you that to be an entrepreneur, it really takes this kind of, of you know, dedication to the business and it's all in and it's agonizing and it's lonely and it's heartbreaking and it's soul-searing and it takes 24-7. On the other hand, I'm a family man. I've got, I've got three kids. I've got a spouse. My, my number one highest and, and most important goal in life is being a parent to my kids. You know, it's, so this is one of those, you know, being an entrepreneur is not easy. And, and so it is really, you know, are there successful entrepreneurs who have managed to raise families and, and, and do this? Yeah. Does it take sacrifice on everybody's part? Yeah. I mean, when, when I was raising my, uh, my, my daughter, um, you know, I was traveling a little bit to, uh, on, on sales trips and partner things and so on. Um, and, I, and I used to take a big calendar when she was a baby. And on the wall, I'd mark at the calendar and put a picture of me every day. And so every day my wife would say, oh, here's, here's daddy. He's coming back in three days over here, right? And, and so I really limited my, my travel. Um, and then, you know, in later years, my, uh, my daughter was asked, you know, how much her father traveled. And she said, oh, you know, all the time, at least, you know, three weeks a month. I said, three days a month, look at my calendar. I was out two days this month. You know, but, but the, but the, and, and so the, the effect of, of this on a family is, is, can be really, really tough. Um, so there is no easy answer to that one. Is it possible? I believe it is. It's increasingly possible. I mean, this, you know, I'm here this week out at SU. I'm also running a company with, you know, 25 people in the middle of a product launch, you know, you know back east. And so I, I spend literally, you know, six hours a day now on email, and I've got my iPhone and everything else. So I'm trying to do that. And meanwhile, I'm corresponding with my kids. I got one kid going to med school next year, another kid, you know, looking for a job, another kid in, in, in college. It's not easy. It's really challenging. But the answer is, if you have to live with yourself as a person, you got to be 
you got to raise a family and be a family person. And if you want to be a successful entrepreneur and with a really scalable player, you got to devote it to the business. They are completely, you know, opposed. But resolving that to a way that, that, that makes the best sense in your particular case is the, is the key issue over here. Not easy. Hi, I'm Dimitri from Bulgaria. So uh, I've been always wondering about uh, the personal characteristics of the entrepreneur and specifically how much selfish an entrepreneur should be, if at all, and how uh, a team cooperation and basically the goals that are given by Singularity University, like pursuing common global goals, uh, balanced out to it, for example, what's suggested by Adam Smith to pursue his own personal uh, interest in order to for the market and things like that. Okay, there are several parts to that question, right? One of them is look at the whole Wikinomics that we were talking about, right? Openness, sharing, peering, giving back, being part, playing as playing well as part of a of an overall ecosystem is really important. So to that extent, there is definite economic benefit in giving back and not being selfish, right? Because if you plan it right and do it right, giving, you know, cast forth your bread on the waters and it'll return tenfold, uh, as the Bible says, apply that somewhat to, to business here, certainly in the open source community. You know, you cast forth your, your work, don't be selfish, share, open, peer, and things will come back to you, right? So why am I standing here? I mean, I've got more things to do than, than, than you can shake a stick at. I, I probably guarantee you, I have eight full-time jobs. I'm running a company in New York. I run New York Angels. I run a private equity fund over here. I've got, you know, I've got you know, all kinds of stuff. Why am I actually helping to fund Singularity U, spending a week of my time out here, doing all this stuff here, and, and, and I'm believing I'm not getting paid for this, right? Why? Because this is my way of giving back. I am sharing. And somehow, I believe, I, whether it is delusional or not, I believe that I am casting forth my bread on the waters. And I believe that all of you are going to go out and create the next generation of global companies. And you know what? You'll remember me. And you'll think kindly of me. And at some point when you, you want advice or you want to have a, an interesting investor, you'll give me a call. And somehow this is, this is good for society. It's good for you guys. And ultimately, it will benefit me. So that's number one in terms of sharing and being open. Number two, when you are up on a plane and they go through these, the safety briefings and they, the oxygen mask get dropped down, what do they say? When they, if you're traveling with a child, when the oxygen mask drops down, the first thing you do is put on your own mask. And then you put on your child's. Now, if you're a parent of you who are parents and have kids, that is the most insane, hardest thing you will ever hear to do. The idea of, of putting your own mask on first instead of your child's sounds ludicrous. You are, if you're a parent, you are naturally biologically inbred to take care of your offspring, to keep the generation going, right? And so the overwhelming desire is to put on your kid's face mask first. But there is a reason that the airlines tell you, put on your own mask first, because if you put on your kid's face mask and you don't get the oxygen and you faint, nobody's going to help your kid. So I have taken that personally for me as one of my watchwords, which is put on your own oxygen mask first. So therefore, there is selfishness in the world. If you don't take care of yourself, you will not be in a position to take care of the rest of the world. You will not be in a position to take care of your company, your employees, your partners, your customers. And so therefore, it's a very fine balance. And only you can figure out what is being selfish and what is being rational. But therefore, you ultimately, I believe, have to come first. If you are total, if you're Mother Teresa and totally selfish and self-abnegating over here, that doesn't work for an entrepreneur. You have to have enough internally to say, I've got to survive, but doing so with integrity, because ultimately my reputation depends on it and my business depends on my reputation. So therefore, I have to take care of myself in a way that makes sense for me and makes sense for everybody else. The third thing in terms of global good and so on. We will talk, we will uh, try and have a session in the summer on social venture, social entrepreneurship. Um, and occasionally in past SU classes have taken me to task for my focus on commercial world instead of impact investing and social venturing and so on. But the, and I'm not gonna get into a whole thing on that now. Suffice to say that the best way, I, I'm a real Adam Smithian, and I really believe that the best way to take care of the world, fix the world, is to do so within the context of capitalism, within the context of what society needs. Otherwise, it's a charity. Then there is a for-profit business where the goal is to maximize profits over here. And then there is a social business, which is what Grameen Bank was when it started. A social business is designed to be self-regenerating. It's not designed to give away money, and it's not designed to make money. It's designed to be money neutral over there. Those are your three choices, and almost only your three choices. The idea of going into business to make a limited profit doesn't work. Because as you've just seen, the entrepreneurial life is insanely hard. Most entrepreneurs don't make it. It is agonizing to say, okay, I'm not going to aim for here. I'm going to aim for here. 
or you know, well, for good. You know, get to here first, and then you can decide to take the money that you made over here and give this part of it away to some good cause over here. But don't try and limit yourself. If you go into a business which is limiting for global good or whatever it is, you're not going to be able to succeed. Make money doing something that is ultimately good for the world, or create a self-sustaining business with no, with no profit there. But it's one of those three choices. One last question. Uh, in the video we just seen, we saw Martin Luther King and, and Mahatma Gandhi. And so my question is that I, my question is, what do you think is the entrepreneur's role in the urgent uh, challenge of overcoming urgent uh, global poverty? Well, I, mean, I, I think that there is an enormous role for, I think ultimately that the solution for global poverty will be entrepreneurship, will rest in entrepreneurship. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with the poverty team track. I actually have an interesting idea that I've been talking to the, uh, uh, the, the, the poverty team uh, project leaders about uh, that I'd like to propose to, to you guys that I think will directly tie entrepreneurship to poverty. But I think it'll be really critical because if you right now, Entrepreneurs are not all Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs. If, if, you, if you accept you know, Gartner's theory about hypomania, and he estimates that about 10% of the world are hypomanic, so somewhere between you know, 1% and 10% of the population generically are, are sort of in the process of being entrepreneurs, are potential entrepreneurs. Well, you know, hello, out of a 7 billion population world, 10% uh, of that? Oh, 700 million people? There aren't 700 million, the US population is 3 and 50, right? So there are, I believe, many, many, many entrepreneurs all over the world who are just waiting for the right kinds of conditions and support and opportunity and role models and, and infrastructure and so on to let them you know, fly as entrepreneurs and create new businesses to help rise people out of poverty to, to improve the world by doing their entrepreneurial thing. And so that's what we'll discuss uh, during the team projects and the rest of this course. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, David.